modern vacuum cleaner is a wonderful contraption. It's really quite magical the way it makes dirt vanish from completely inaccessible places. And before it was invented, houses were just much, much dirtier places, more like my workshop. Though even my workshop isn't usually quite as dirty as this. It may be a myth that vacuum cleaners are labour-saving devices. It's said that people spend just as long cleaning their houses today as they did 100 years ago. But these machines certainly have made houses cleaner. Well, in this programme, I hope to look at exactly how vacuum cleaners work and how they evolved. Without vacuum cleaners, the only way to clean carpets and upholstery was to take them outside and beat them. An activity that was traditionally performed just once a year, the spring clean. There was considerable incentive to invent a cleaning machine, particularly because Victorian houses were so cluttered and full of soft furnishings. Numerous patents for sweeping and beating machines were taken out from the 1850s onwards, and some of these did include primitive suction devices. But the practical vacuum cleaner had to wait for the arrival of reasonably small and efficient power sources. By 1900, the first internal combustion engines had appeared, and amongst other things, they were used to power compressors to generate compressed air. Several Edwardians experimented cleaning carpets and upholstery with compressed air, but the problem was that the dust just went everywhere. And then settled back down exactly where it had come from. A demonstration of this rather inadequate cleaning system on cleaning railway carriages in St Pancras Station in 1901 was witnessed by an engineer called Herbert Cecil Booth. Booth was a civil engineer who designed bridges and the enormous big wheels popular at the turn of the century. This one was put up in Blackpool in 1896. It seemed obvious to Booth that sucking the dirt into a container through a filter would be a more sensible idea. And his very first experiment, holding a hanky over a sofa and sucking hard through it, left the hanky filthy and proved the principle to himself. His first machine was simply a cloth bag to collect the dirt and a suction pump. It worked well, but it was very large, so it had to be parked outside customers' houses. It became known as the Noisy Serpent, and he was frequently sued for frightening passing horses. The success of Booth's machine was largely due to the coronation of Edward VII in 1902. In all the preparations, it hadn't been noticed until the last minute that the carpets under the throne in Westminster Abbey were filthy. Booth's machine was the only effective way of cleaning the carpet without removing it. The king later heard of this and ordered a demonstration at Buckingham Palace, buying two machines. Your apparatus is frightfully impressive. Oh, thank you very much, sir, thank you very much. Oh. Booth added clear inspection tubes so people could watch the dirt being sucked in, and the machines became prime attractions at fashionable soirees. With royal patronage, the success of the machine was assured. A most marvellous modern invention. Mm -hmm. Booth's machine caught the public imagination, but was much too large and cumbersome for most homes, so various other manufacturers started introducing much smaller, hand-powered machines. This one's the sweeper vac made in San Francisco, the British Queen, doesn't seem to be doing very much this one, a bit difficult to use too, uh, the star, <clears throat> this, one, this one feels more comfortable, just swept up a feather, and uh, What's this one called? The Reeves Pneumatic Broom. Doesn't sweep very much up at a time. Nearly got that bit of dirt. No. <clears throat> Most of these machines would have been considerably less effective than a simple dustpan and brush. But at the time, there was a phobia against dust that was believed to be full of germs. A French doctor in 1907 wrote, 
Dry sweeping and dusting are homicidal practices. They consist of taking dirt that has been lying on the floor and on the furniture, mixing it with the atmosphere and causing it to be inhaled by members of the household. In reality, it would be infinitely preferable to leave the dust alone where it was. Well, in reality, these machines were so ineffective, they probably did just that. This is uh, the daisy number two. Nice action, nice crank and bellows, but I don't actually think it's uh, getting anything off the carpet. And uh, this one is the uh, baby daisy. Oh, it's much bigger than the daisy number two. Um, slightly difficult coordinating with both the actions at once. Doesn't seem to be doing too well either. Meanwhile, in America, a caretaker called Spangler had patented a portable vacuum cleaner powered by an electric motor. He sold the patent to a harness maker called Hoover, who was worried that his trade was falling as more people changed from riding horses to driving cars. Hoover was very successful and started producing machines in other countries, including Britain. In the carpet, in the carpet, excavating through the pile, worked a pit gang called the Grip Gang, digging deeper all the while. Oh, my carpet, oh, my carpet, oh, my carpet, don't forget, with a Hoover, yes, the Hoover, we will be the blight of yet. Oh, my carpet, oh, my carpet, Oh, my carpet, don't forget, we're the Hoover, yes, the Hoover, we will be the blight of yet. The basic modern Hoover has really changed very little. We cut part of this one away so you can see what's inside. This is the fan that does the sucking, and it makes the brushes and beater bars go round as well. The dirt is dislodged by the rotating brushes, sucked straight through the fan and into the dust bag at the back. The cylinder type of vacuum cleaner is slightly different. It's actually more like Booth's original machine. I'll take the bottom off this one. In this sort, the dust comes straight into the dust bag. And the air passes straight through the paper that acts as a filter and goes through the fan and finally out the grill on the top of the machine. So the positions of the fan and the dust bag are reversed. And because it's only clean air that's passing through the fan, the shape of the vanes can be much more intricate. So this sort usually has a much stronger sort of sucking power. And the bin type and the more modern flattened cylinder type are just the same as this, though the layout leaves slightly more room for bigger dust bags. The upright vacuum cleaner with a rigid dust box is a sort of hybrid. We've cut one in half so you can see what's inside. It has rotating brushes, just like a hoover, but inside the air and the dirt come straight up the back and into the dust bag, so its layout in some ways is, is more like the cylinder vacuum cleaner because it's only clean air that goes out the, comes out the bottom of the dust bag and goes through the enclosed fan and then finally comes out the back of the machine. Well, there are advantages and disadvantages of all these different types of vacuum cleaner and a recent witch survey found that in overall performance there's really very little to choose between them all. By the 1920s, many companies were producing electric vacuum cleaners. Booth himself had started making them under the trade name Goblin. One of his employees was a man called Bill Sutton. I joined uh, Goblin in 1929, mm. um, although I had a relative with the company many years before, so I knew quite a bit about the vacuum cleaner business as a youngster. This model was produced in 1908 and appeared at the first Idle Home Exhibition. Would you like to do a bit of cleaning if I operate it? Oh, I see it's a two-person machine. Yes, yes. oh yes. Yeah. If I turn this handle, you do the cleaning. Well, it's getting something up. In fact, they used to, at the exhibition, have to go back to the factory and make another one if it's an old one. Although better than most hand-powered vacuum cleaners, it was still rather inconvenient. 
so Booth started developing his own electric models. As you'll see, it's got the old dolly switch and uh, some very old-fashioned flex. Scene. They wouldn't pass it with the approvals board today. <laughs> Where does the dust go? Well, it actually goes in here. Oh, I see, yes. Uh, and you undo this to get at the dirt to empty the machine. This machine was first produced in 1930. Rather a unique machine in that it gives you the upright situation for easy cleaning. It sold in, uh, for £5.19 and sixpence at that time. But the interesting thing is that for dusting, all you need to do is undo the dust bag from this position here and put your arm through the dust bag and do your dusting. <laughs> we did have some other tools for it, for dusting, mm. but of course uh, that's another story. This particular model, a Goblin Ace, is 210 volts. Whereas today the standard voltage is 240. In the 30s, Bristol, there were two voltages. In London, they went down as, as far as 100 volts in certain cases. And there were, were there electricity shops where you could sell these things? Oh, no. The uh, electrical shops weren't in existence then. There were only a cycle shop who did the odd electrical product. The industry had to employ vast numbers of direct selling people. In fact, Goblin had two and a half thousand at the peak of people knocking doors. Oh. You've heard of the radio? You have now got electricity, but this is what you haven't got, the vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Look, it is... Well, I don't know. I... Yes, no, no, mm -hmm. I'll just take this wire, plug it into your sockets like that, mm -hmm. and we and will have a demonstration. If you would care to stand up a minute, madam. See? Now then, did you know that in that chair is hidden dirt? Every part of your house has got hidden dirt. Look, it's all in there now, madam. Look, this is what you were sitting on. <gasps> Dust! Oh! The sales mostly had to be made of an evening because the only person who was entitled to sign a hire purchase agreement was the husband. Hmm. And in most cases, sales had to be made on a Friday or Saturday evening when the pay packet came in. Otherwise, you didn't get the deposit. I'm now going to look at the various parts of the vacuum cleaner in greater detail. First, the motor. Electric motors are rather baffling devices, but they all depend basically on the ability of electricity to magnetise things. If I uh, wrap a bit of wire round a nail... Oops. Oh, dear. I've got it tangled <laughs> up. Um... The more turns, the stronger the magnetism. I'm going to use 12 volts DC from a car battery. And of course you must never ever use mains for something like this. The nail becomes magnetic when I complete the circuit and when I break it again, most of the magnetism is lost. And if I wrap the wire around a little copper tube and hold it above the nail, then the magnetic attraction will uh, pull the nail off the table. Just get it slightly warm. This is an industrial electromagnet. The coil of wires in here, and this is the lump of metal it uh, pulls in. This one's actually um, out of a fruit machine. It's the device that pushes the coins out when you win. Well, I use these devices a lot on the machines that I make. I made this for a local solicitor. It's a portrait of the founder of the firm, his great uncle. And he wanted to be able to control it so that it would react to his client's sometimes dubious confidences. In the end, he got cold feet and uh, placed the control box so that the clients themselves could use it. Well, if you look at the back, <coughs> you can see that the device that makes the wig go up in the air is one of these electric ma electromagnets. And by themselves, these electromagnets can only produce this rather jerky linear action. But it's actually not too difficult to use the electromagnetic attraction to make something rotate.
To show the principles of a simple electric motor, I've made a motor out of virtual rubbish. Nails, hacksaw blade, an old needle, a cork, and a dog food can. The commutator is the part in the vacuum cleaner motor I've made from a cork with wires running up there. It acts as a sort of rotating switch. Each wire is attached to a coil. When the wires are in contact with the brass strips, current passes through. So at any time, only one pair of coils are energized. These pair of coils here are magnetized by the electric current and they're attracted to this pair of coils. Now, when it pulls to, to there, these coils switch off and it brings on the next pair of coils which are attracted to there. Of course, they switch off, bringing in the next pair, causing a rotating motion. I'll switch on. The vacuum cleaner motor doesn't at first sight look like Rex's tin can motor, but if you look inside, you can see it has a lot of the same elements. This is the commutator, the rotating contacts. These are the coils of wire rotating around the shaft. And these are the coils of wire around the outside, making them both magnetic. Well, in fact, there are many different types of electric motor, but they all depend on the basic ability of electricity to produce magnetism. It's really quite difficult to imagine how inconvenient the world must have been without any electric motors. Most of the machines in the home depend on them. Vacuum cleaners, power tools, washing machines, fridges, tape recorders and countless other gadgets. Steam engines, their predecessors, were hot and heavy and needed several hours stoking to get up pressure before they would work. Factories used to have a single steam engine connected to every machine in the place by a very elaborate set of belts and clutches. This was not very convenient or safe in a factory and totally impractical in the home. The bit that actually does the sucking is the enclosed fan next to the motor. I can show you where the air goes if I hold some smoke over it. You can see that all the air is actually drawn straight through the middle of the motor to get to the fan. And the reason for this is that it helps to keep the motor cool. You can often feel the air coming out of the end of a vacuum cleaner is quite warm. And without this air passing through the motor, it would very quickly overheat. The fan itself works with these rotating vanes that whiz round and round and uh, fling the air outwards. The air comes in the middle and... Uh, the vanes go round, flinging the air outwards, and then there's a second set of vanes that doesn't rotate, a static set, and this, these channel the air back to the middle again. Then there's another set, a second set of rotating vanes that uh, fling the air outwards, and finally there's a second set of static vanes that channel the air back to the middle again. And having these two stages doubles the suction power. Well, one surprising thing about these fans is that they actually need less power to work when the inlet's blocked up. I can show you this um, with this meter, which shows how much current the motor is using. And uh, if I turn it on... You can actually hear the pitch of the motor rising when I block the inlet up and that's because it's actually running faster but of course it's also overheating because there's no air passing through it so it's not really a very good idea. The power of the fan is quite surprising. Here we fix the outlet of a vacuum cleaner to a plastic bag. The air pressure in the bag can quite comfortably lift my van off the ground. The vacuum cleaner actually has the power to inflate things on a much larger scale. This is a pig built for the Pink Floyd by a local firm. Once it's inflated, 
A miniature car vacuum cleaner is enough to compensate for the air lost through any holes and keep it full of air. And a full-size vacuum cleaner can keep enormous things inflated. The only time I've ever used a vacuum cleaner was for a machine that didn't need any of its impressive power. This is a collecting box I made for an ecological charity called Common Ground. It's a sort of pun on its name, showing a bit of ground being shared by different sorts of creature. The ground is actually a bit of rubber. I did my first experiments holding bits of rubber over a vacuum cleaner nozzle. <laughs> Underneath, each, of, uh, the fo each footprint is connected to the suction pump at the bottom here by one of these hoses via a valve, each one by a separate valve, actually out of the washing machines. And this, this timer down the bottom here turns the, the valves on in sequence. The last important part of the vacuum cleaner is the dust bag, which acts as the filter. The paper or cloth contains minute holes which trap most of the dirt but let the air pass straight through. Of course, any bits of dirt that are smaller than the size of these holes, which are about one two hundredth of a millimetre in diameter, will pass straight through the bag. I can show you this with um, this smoke cartridge that contains minute particles of red dye. Um, if I put the nozzle, put it next to the nozzle, you'll see the dye come straight through the machine and out through the grill here. Oh, I've got turned on. Normally, about 15% of household dust is below this critical size and passes straight through the machine. Rex used to repair domestic appliances and found people often didn't realise this. Sometimes I used to be called out to a machine that wasn't working and the customer had actually fitted a plastic bag inside the cloth bag so they could dispose of the dirt easily. Well, this, of course, completely blocked the airflow and there was no suction at all. And uh, obviously it wouldn't work. Even the Disposable paper bags need changing quite frequently. Some customers used to use one paper bag and empty it continuously, and they do lose their efficiency, and the little pores in the paper get blocked with dust, and they just don't work. Occasionally, um, one or two clients had actually um, had a machine for 10 years or so, and they'd still got the original packet of paper bags, and they'd only ever used one. The vacuum cleaner is really quite a simple machine just a motor, a fan and a dust bag. But it does have a particularly hard life being pushed and tugged about all the time. Although they used to be sold with lifetime guarantees, today they rarely last more than a few years. The modern vacuum cleaner may not be perfect, but it is extraordinarily good value for money. In 1950, a vacuum cleaner cost about the same amount as the average weekly wage. Today, it costs a lot less than half that. An enormous amount of energy and cunning has gone into reducing the manufacturing costs and perhaps for their price today we can't really expect them to last for very long. Although vacuum cleaners are now rather flimsy and unsatisfying machines and their short lifespan is ecologically very unsound, they do retain more character than most other household machines and I can't help rather liking them. <laughs> <laughs>